article now from the New America Foundation discussion on the use of unmanned aerial drones. Georgetown University law professor and former Defense Department advisor Rosa Brooks suggests that new rules might be necessary for governing the use of lethal force by drones or other means as the U.S. pursues terrorist threats across the world. She also notes that civilian casualties and other problems associated with drones also occur during conventional military operations. We're going to go ahead and, and start uh, with the remainder of our program. I know there's a lot to talk about, uh, but in the interest of staying on time, we're going to we're going to reconvene here. I hope the, you enjoyed the uh, the empanadas. I'm still thinking about the last conversation about the use of drones to track poachers and animal populations, and I found it fascinating. I also found myself thinking about my, uh, my extracurricular activity of coaching eight-year-olds uh, play soccer and wondering if, uh, if I couldn't deploy some drones to help with that herding task. Um, so uh, a lot of you were here in the morning and, and met Rosa then, but I will introduce her again. Rosa Brooks is going to give a presentation entitled Flying Mission Creep, What We Can Learn from the Pentagon's History with Drones. Rosa is a Bernard Schwartz Fellow here at the New America Foundation, as well as a professor of law at Georgetown University, a columnist for Foreign Policy Magazine, and she is now going to give us a presentation. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Andres, and uh, welcome back from your empanadas. Uh, if any of you still have empanadas, uh, I congratulate you. They were There was fierce competition for those empanadas towards the end there. Um, so I'm going to shift our focus a little bit. I, for most of the day, we've been talking about the uh, non-military and domestic applications of uh, drones, a.k.a. unmanned aerial vehicles, a.k.a. remotely piloted aircraft, a.k.a. whatever you want to call them. Um, I'm going to keep talking about them as drones just because one word is always better than three. Um, we've been talking about the domestic and non-military applications. I'm going to shift uh, a little bit here and talk about the issue that has been in the news much more, which is uh, U.S. drone strikes overseas, particularly in the context of drone strikes in places such as Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, and maybe, we don't know, uh, a few other places as well, uh, perhaps Mali, perhaps the Philippines, et cetera. Um, so let me start by just very briefly trying to recapitulate uh, what is and isn't different about drones, um, because I think this is one of those situations, we've already heard a lot about this, where it's really hard to disentangle what is an issue of a technology and what is an issue of a policy that may be enabled and facilitated by the technology but is not the same thing. Um, so first let me just talk about some of the reasons that people get upset about drones that I think are, are red herrings, are not the right reasons to be upset or they're reasons to be upset but not about drones as such. And then talk a little bit about what I think we should be quite concerned about. Uh, and, it, and as I suggested, it has much more to do with the policies that are enabled by these technologies rather than the technologies in and of themselves. So when we talk about drone strikes, what we talk about, we talk about civilian casualties. We often talk about the so-called anxieties about the so-called sort of video game type killing qualities that they seem to enable and worry about whether this leads to a sort of moral disconnect from killing. Uh, and we talk about uh, the ethics of long distance killing and tend to talk about this as if this is something very different from other things that have gone before. I'm going to suggest that those are mostly red herrings, okay? Civilian casualties. Uh, do drone strikes cause unintended civilian casualties? Yes, they do. 
Wars cause unintended civilian casualties. Airplanes flown by human pilots that drop bombs cause unintended civilian casualties. Special operations forces raids cause unintended civilian casualties. Um, and it is absolutely reasonable for us to say we think that the military strategy and tactics the United States pr is pursuing right now is causing far too many civilian deaths and far too much suffering. That's fine, and that's a discussion I think we should have, and I, I am inclined to agree with it. Uh, but I think we should distinguish that from the issue of drones as such, because if anything, as a weapons delivery technology, drones are probably somewhat better than the alternatives at being able to tell the difference between an intended and an unintended target. Now that doesn't mean our targeting is only as good as our intelligence, right? If we have crummy intelligence that says, oh, those people over there are militants, terrorists, what have you, uh, if our intelligence is wrong, then it's not that we get the unintended target, we get our intended target, we just, we just were, we were misinformed and we got the wrong people, period. But that's also, that's not an issue of the technology, the drone technology, the weapons delivery technology. That's an issue of intelligence. If we're targeting the wrong people because it's just stupid, they are militants, they are terrorists, but it's just self-destructive, uh, not in our national interest to be attempting to kill every last low-level militant we can possibly find, that's also a different issue. That's an issue of U.S. policy and strategy and tactics, not an issue of the technology as such. I'm also not super inclined to give a lot of, of, of credence to the anxiety that drones are bad because they enable long-distance killing. Um, you know, the history of military technology is a history of the evolution of weapons that are designed to do exactly that, you know, from the, the spear rather than the sword to the crossbow uh, to artillery to machine guns. You know, and, and this, in that sense, I don't think is qualitatively different, nor I think does it create qualitatively different moral and ethical concerns. A pilot flying at 30,000 feet is pretty long distance, it's pretty video game like if, we, if that we, is what we think is the concern. Whereas if anything, there's some evidence that uh, drones strike, uh, that, that the people at the other end of the technology, it is actually more up close and personal precisely because the nature of the technology enables drone pilots from a distance to see human faces in a way that the pilot of a manned airplane cannot see and to see them over an extended period of time and then poof, they're gone and then go back and supervise your kid's soccer game or coach or whatever, not supervise, you don't supervise soccer, do you? I'm conflating different terminologies here. Um, coach, coach, thank you. Um, so there's actually a lot of evidence that there are pretty high rates of, for instance, post-traumatic post stress disorder amongst drone pilots for exactly that reason, that it may be killing at a distance, but it feels up close and personal in a particularly jarring way. So those I think are red herrings. Those are, I think, areas in in which I don't think drones as a weapons delivery technology presents a new issue. But here's what they do do, okay? Uh, they reduce the perceived costs of using lethal force, particularly across borders, outside of traditional battlefields, so-called hot battlefields. Um, not as much as people think. A nation with sophisticated air defenses is uh, more than a match for in current U.S. drone technologies, but certainly in either ungoverned spaces or nations with weak air defenses or consenting states, uh, they enable the sense that we can use force across borders at no risk to us, no risk of death to American personnel, uh, cheap, lower cost economically. Drones are just cheaper than their counterparts, uh, at least at this moment. It depends a little bit how you calculate, but. They're certainly perceived as cheaper. Uh, as we develop more sophisticated drones, they may become less cheap compared to their manned analogs. Uh, and finally, precisely because they enable uh, those doing the targeting to do a better job of ensuring that they don't hit the people they don't want to hit, they create the illusion that they're actually lower cost in terms of civilian casualties than other alternatives. Uh, you know, that the likely unintended deaths, if you use other means of killing people from a special operations raid to manned aircraft uh, are a lot higher. And these things combine, I think, to make policymakers think, well, heck, you know, if there's a bad guy who we would like to get rid of in a foreign country, and we can do it in a way that risks no American lives, we can do it in a way that we believe minimizes the risk of unintended civilian casualties relative to other alternative means, uh, and we can do it just for fewer dollars, why not? Uh, and so I do think it reduces that threshold for the decision 
to use force in foreign countries uh, in a way that just makes it a little bit more tempting. And we've seen that. That is what I, I you know, I think this is a classic mission creep situation that we, we began when we had fewer drones available. Uh, we were using them in much more limited circumstances to go after a much smaller number of much higher level targets. And what we've seen in the last few years, in particular under President Obama, has been a kind of a, a spread both to more and more places geographically um, uh, outside of hot battlefields and to an expanding uh, universe of targets who are further and further sort of away from any notion of terrorist mastermind and increasingly further and further away even from any meaningful link to Al Qaeda or to 9-11 or to any kind of imminent threat to the United States directly. Take Al-Shabaab in Somalia, uh, not a particularly likable group. Uh, but also not a group that had anything much to do with 9-11, as far as I know, uh, and not a group that I, don't, that I think that anyone thinks has any remotely imminent interest or ability to attack the United States as such, that their ambitions are primarily local. But we've got this neat technology that makes it relatively easy to go after them, so why not? It enables that kind of mission spread, s mission creep. So here, here's what... I think we should be worried about, right? So I said that I think in some ways the issue of civilian casualties, long distance killing, are a bit of red herrings, not because they're not important, but because they're not unique to this technology. Uh, they're part of broader issues of strategy or uh, the decision to use force in the first place. Um, but if those are red herrings, what should we care about? And here I think we should care about two things, and, and they're, they're overlapping, they're interconnected. I'm gonna sort of arbitrarily distinguish them into two categories, but they're really obviously connected to each other. And one of those is, is we should have a set of strategic concerns, and the other is a bunch of concerns about the rule of law. So here's the strategic concern. Uh, the strategic concern is as we use these strikes more and more, uh, you know, I don't like, uh, I never thought I would be favorably quoting former Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, uh, but he famously asked during the Iraq War, uh, how do we know if we are uh, creating new terrorists faster than we can kill them? And I think that's, that's an obvious question to ask about the expanding use of US drone strikes outside of hot battlefields. Uh, even if we are right about every single target, even if our intelligence is good, they're all bad guys. Uh, you know, even bad guys have children, families, friends, networks, uh, people who are gonna be left grieving, people who are gonna be left angry. You know, so there's just a question of, does this actually make sense if our goal is to reduce the long-term threat of terrorist attack against the United States? Is this, does this actually make any sense? Because we do know, you know, there's ample evidence that these are extremely unpopular, they are perceived as causing many, many civilian casualties, uh, that people, that, that they, are, they are frightening. If you think that death can rain down on you from the sky at any moment, it's not a lot of consolation to know that the U.S. is trying really hard to get the right people, uh, you know, that it can cause a lot of resentment and anger against the United States. So that's sort of the strategic question. Does this actually make any sense as part of a counterterrorism strategy? Here's the rule of law question, and this, I think, is the, the deepest and most troubling piece of this. Um, uh, when drones are used in traditional battlefields, they're just another weapon, you know, and they're subject to the same rules. We, you know, they're sub, we've, had, we've had law governing means and methods of warfare for centuries now in one way or another. Uh, but when they're used off of hot battlefields, I think that their use fundamentally challenges our most core rule of law ideas. Right, okay, so what's the rule of law? Well, we read the Declaration of Independence, right? Uh, at its core, this is an idea about the importance of finding institutions and rules to rein in the arbitrary exercise of state power uh, and to prevent the abuse of power, um, to ensure predictability and stability, to make sure that individuals know that their lives, their liberty, their property will not be taken away from them arbitrarily and abusively. Uh, so here's why we've got a problem right now, and I think it's a problem that goes well beyond. It's not a problem about drones. It's a problem about the nature of modern warfare and how we define modern warfare. So in ordinary life, you go outside, you walk out of this building, you see a guy on the street, uh, and you, you, know, you take your iPhone out of your bag and you hit him on the head with it and you kill him, and what happens to you? The police come along and you're arrested and you're probably charged with criminal homicide. And if you say, but he was my enemy, 
it's not going to do you a lot of good, right? It doesn't matter. And in fact, this applies to state authorities as well. If the police go and kill somebody and say, well, he was an enemy of the state, uh, still against the law, no question about it. Um, in ordinary circumstances, we know that. We, you know, we know, we know what, is, what is against the law and what is not. Um, but obviously, sometimes the ordinary legal rules do not apply. When we're in a war, when the law of war is the body of law that applies, uh, combatants in a war are not only permitted to kill enemy combatants, under certain circumstances they're more or less required to do so, uh, at risk of being punished themselves. Um, we have a different set of rules relating to the willful killing of human beings and the degree, if any, of due process that goes along with that. Um, that's not in and of itself a problem, right? To have one body of rules for one set of circumstances, another body of rules for another set of circumstances, one body of rules that says it's not okay to go out and kill somebody, another body that says actually here are the circumstances in which it is. That's not necessarily a rule of law problem as long as we can tell the difference between when one set of rules applies and when the other set of rules applies, right? And in law professor terms, uh, this is the law of war is so-called lex specialis, the fancy Latin way of saying it's special law. It applies to special circumstances, those special circumstances being armed conflicts. And the rest of the time, we're under lex generalis, general law, which says, no, you can't go out and kill people. Uh, the problem is that right now, uh, we, do not, we do not know how to categorize threats posed by geographically diffuse non-state actors such as Al-Qaeda and its fabled associates. We don't know. They're sort of like war in the sense that, they, that some of these organizations can p possess the means of lethal force on a scale that we previously equated with state action. Um, on the other hand, they're sort of like crime. They occupy a little bit of an in-between. I think for a long time we've been kind of paralyzed since 9-11 in this very sterile debate between, uh, well, is this a war or is this crime? Well, if it's, it doesn't look like crime, therefore it must be war, or it doesn't look like war, therefore it must be crime. I think the fact is it's a little bit of both, and yet we have legal frameworks that are all or nothing, one or the other. The problem, though, uh, is that if we have a law of armed conflict, uh, under the law of armed conflict, U.S. drone strikes, um, if we think that's the body of law that applies, they're perfectly lawful. If the law of armed conflict applies, then when the U.S. strikes a target you know, in Yemen or in Pakistan, you can kill an enemy combatant under the law of war while they're sleeping. It doesn't, you know, you can cause collateral damage uh, as long as it's proportionate and so forth. That's okay. Uh, if the law of war doesn't apply, then these are murders. They're extrajudicial executions, and they violate international human rights law, and depending, they probably violate the domestic law of that country. They may violate the domestic laws of the United States. Trouble is, right now, we don't have any principled means of being able to say clearly which it is, uh, because we have a concept of armed conflict that stretches from World War II up to whatever is happening right now in Yemen. And I would put it to you that if our notion of armed conflict is so capacious that World War II and what's happening now in Pakistan or Yemen can both be described under it, it's not doing a lot of good for us anymore. It's not a very useful construct. So this is the long-term challenge, right? The long-term challenge uh, is not a challenge that has to do with drones. The long-term challenge is a challenge that has to do with trying to think through do we need a different set of rules, a different set of international norms governing the cross-border use of force for these threats that are warlike in some respects, crime-like in other sets respects? Because right now we have a kind of a radical indeterminacy where two people can, with a straight face, tell you radically different stories about the same event, with one person saying, there's nothing new here at all. This is just a routine use of force in the context of an armed conflict in which one state is targeting combatants of another state that they're and their enemies, and what's the problem? This You don't have judicial review. You don't put judges on the battlefield. That doesn't make any sense. There's nothing new here. And the other folks are saying, that's not what we have here. What we have here is simple murder. We have here a, you know, an abuse of power and a deep, deep challenge to the rule of law. And I don't think we have a principled means for being able to say that one person is wrong and the other is right. That, to me, is the most scary thing of all. You know, that we need to find a new vocabulary and a new framework for actually thinking about these problems. So I am out of time, and Adam is waving little stop signs at me. Um, so I will stop, although there is much, much more to say. I, we're not doing questions, Adam, are we? Okay, and no questions are permitted. Um, so just. <laughs>
everything I said, write it down. Uh, no, I, I'd be happy to talk about it more because uh, there is much, much more to be said on this. But, but for now, that will be that will have to be the end. Tonight on C-SPAN 2, the future of America's military alliance with Europe. Then a Senate confirmation hearing for the nominee to head the Environmental Protection Agency. And later, more from the New America Foundation's forum on unmanned drones. On the next Washington Journal, Elise Vebeck of The Hill on a government report on fees charged by hospitals. Then Forbes Technology reporter Andy Greenberg on a plastic handgun made by 3D printers, with blueprints available on the Internet. And high school teachers Andrew Kaneen and Daniel Larson with help for students getting ready to take the advanced placement U.S. government exam. Washington Journal, live at 7 a.m. Eastern on C-SPAN. At a joint European Parliament Committee hearing Monday, NATO Secretary General Anders Foe Rasmussen told members that Europe needed to back up its diplomacy with military efforts, noting that Europe would lose its credibility and influence in the world if there were no real commitments in security and defense, and called on European member states to shoulder the burden with the U.S. and other allies. Twenty-one of the 27 European Union countries are NATO members. Following his remarks, the Secretary General answered questions on Syria, NATO's relationship with the European Union, and priorities for the upcoming EU Defense Summit scheduled for later this year. Colleagues, we have an exchange of views with Ander Fogh Rasmussen, Secretary General of NATO, on the future of European defense and NATO perspective. I welcome Secretary General Rasmussen to this joint meeting of our committee and this subcommittee on security and defense. I also welcome colleagues from national parliaments in front of me. Six countries are represented. And uh, it is almost a year since Mr. Rasmussen last joined us to brief ahead of NATO Chicago Summit. And this exchange of views is particularly timely, bearing in mind the challenges facing NATO and the EU ahead of the Afghanistan handover, but also in the light of the important discussion on European defense that is expected at December European Council. I would underline that these two issues, operational challenges also in areas which range from Somalia to Sahel, and the need to improve European defense cooperation are critical issues, especially at a time of economic constraint and political uncertainty. I would remind that the European Parliament has been consistent in arguing that EU and NATO are complementary organizations for European, Euro-Atlantic, and global security interests. The Lisbon Treaty confirms the vital role of each organization. I would emphasize that it is important to build on these declarations and treaty provisions and invest in European defense before declining budgets and uncoordinated cuts in our capabilities undermine our ability to take care of security, especially in our neighborhood and further afield. I mention the fact that uh, the December European Council provides an important opportunity for, to work for further and deeper defense cooperation towards the implementation of permanent structures cooperation for the greater use of coalition of the willings, including how to use the battle groups, and of course, for building lasting partnerships like the one with NATO. Uh, let me express concern about the escalation in attacks in Afghanistan as we enter the fighting season. We saw the tragic loss of, wife, of lives last week of seven NATO soldiers. 
And uh, I would ask how you think the security situation will develop as the Andover draws closer and the eyes of troops are gone. I stop here and uh, I leave you the floor for your um, presentation. Thank you very much and welcome again. Thank you very much, Mr. Provera, for that uh, kind uh, introduction. Um, it's uh, really a great pleasure for me to once again uh, meet uh, members of, of the two uh, committees uh, and chairpersons from um, foreign relations and defense committees in, of national uh, uh, parliaments. Um, we, we meet regularly, actually, uh, so, so I'm glad to see many familiar uh, faces. Um, and I'm looking forward to another lively uh, discussion. So l let me make just a few points. Um, I'm fully committed to a strong and open Europe. I firmly believe that Europe must have a strong common security and defense policy. Um, and I'm pleased that there will be a European Council dedicated uh, to uh, security and defense next December. It will actually be the first time since the start of, of the global financial crisis uh, that heads of state and government uh, focus on this vital dimension of um, a strong and open uh, Europe. But let me also be frank. If European nations do not make a firm commitment to invest, to invest in security and defense, then all talk about a strengthened European defense and security policy will just be hot air. And it won't bring us any closer to the strong and open Europe that we all want. So as we look ahead to December, we should all keep three things firmly uh, in mind. First, we Europeans must understand that soft power alone is really no power at all. Without hard capabilities, to back up its diplomacy, Europe will lack credibility and influence. It will risk being a global spectator rather than the powerful global actor that it can be and should be. Our shared experience in, um, in the Western Balkans is a case in point. Restoring stability there has required a mix, a mix of hard and soft power. We saw this uh, with the conclusion of the recent agreement between uh, Belgrade um, and Pristina. The agreement was brokered uh, by the European Union and, uh, and I commend Cathy Ashton for her excellent work. But uh, both parties wanted assurance that NATO would guarantee the security to implement the agreement. Second, um, a continuing decline in European defence and European defence budgets will inevitably result in a declining role for our continent on the global stage. And Europe will be unable to participate in crisis management. The only way to avoid this is by holding the line on defence spending to stop the cuts and to start reinvesting in security as soon as our economies uh, recover. Meanwhile, we need to make better use of what we have to do more together as Europeans within the European Union and within NATO to deliver the critical defence capabilities that are too expensive for any individual country to deliver alone. 
Finally, having the right capabilities is important, but it's not enough. We must also have the political will to use them to deal with security challenges on Europe's doorstep, to help manage crises further away that might affect us here at home, and to better share the security burden with our North American allies. For this to happen, European nations need to develop a truly global perspective, a global perspective. We must not become absorbed by our domestic economic woes. We must look outwards, not inwards. And we need Europe and North America to talk more regularly, more openly and more frankly. <clears throat> within the unique transatlantic forum that is NATO and between NATO and the European Union. So, in conclusion, the European Council in December should showcase a Europe that is both able to act and willing to act. And it should encourage the European Union and NATO to do more together, to consult more, coordinate more, and cooperate more. To get us there will require strong political resolve, including here in this House, as well as in national parliaments. I'm confident that we can rise to the challenge because we owe it to our taxpayers and voters to give them the best security that money can buy. And with that as an introduction, I look very much forward to a stimulating discussion this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary General for your speech and uh, for myself I want to uh, give my regards to you that you are able to come to us again and have this discussion with us again. Mr. Salafranca is the first one who has asked for the floor. Thank you. I am always too, I'm too late and then too fast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Juan Ignacio, I won't take any questions away from you. I would like to begin by thanking the Secretary General for his regular and welcome and useful attendance at our committee meetings. Thank you for your extremely clear message on European capabilities and the joint security and defence policy. I have taken note of the fact that you would like to see the policy developed in a vigorous fashion. Your speech is very much along the lines of what the US uh, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates said two years ago when he was in Brussels. He called on Europeans to do more, to do better, particularly when it comes to budgets and capabilities. That is indeed a major concern for us all. Now we are all familiar with the institutional difficulties when it comes to the relationship between the European Union and NATO. We know that these political and uh, institutional difficulties cannot be resolved in the short term or easily. Given that fact, what avenues can we explore to further improve coordination between the two institutions? What do you think are the possible or existing uh, areas where we can work more closely together? 
And let me finish up with a comment on a recent trip to Northwood. We visited the uh, HQ there. We met with the Maritime Command, the NATO Maritime Command for Atalanta. and the NATO presence in the Indian Ocean. So I am thinking about the post-2014, post-Afghanistan period. NATO is looking to fresh horizons uh, at any cost. Is that a reasonable approach? Has that been properly coordinated with other international organizations? Is there consensus within NATO on this approach? And in what areas does NATO plan to become more active? Thank you. Thank, thank you. I too would like to thank the NATO Secretary General for his presence. Let me begin by saying that we regret the death last Saturday of a number of soldiers deployed to Afghanistan. Our condolences. Secretary General, let me say that we fully subscribe to your analysis. The European Union should not just be a military power, but rather a political and economic force as well. The European Union can be effective and credible in the way it tackles the new threats, and so it must be responsible in it, the positions it takes. We do, however, struggle to mobilize four to 5,000 uh, soldiers for, for, for operations. Now, I have two specific questions. Firstly, on Syria. In NATO, what analysis have you drawn of the Israeli operations in Syria? How may it affect security in a neighboring country such as Turkey? What are the options? What are the lessons that can be drawn from the aerial exclusion zone in Syria? And what might the impact be on Syria? Second question. I would like to pick up on what Mr. Donjon said. What is the scenario for Afghanistan post-2014? And finally, to what extent is NATO working on smart defense and how is this compatible with the pooling and sharing approach that the European Union is applying to its common security and defence policy? Thank you. Mr. Klichter now has the floor. He is a member of the European Parliament, a member of the Polish Senate and a defence minister. Mr. Chairman, uh, it's a great pleasure to to, to, to see you, Anders, uh, again, and uh, to talk about, uh, as far as I understand, the contribution of Europe to NATO and uh, to the European uh, Union's uh, CSDP. I have three marks. first one is uh, about the necessity of continuing transatlantic cooperation, in, uh, not only in operations, but also in security of, uh, of Europe. Uh, the changes in the U.S. military strategy may weaken our mm, uh, common commitment to security of, uh, of Europe. That's why uh, it's obvious that uh, we should in Europe uh, to uh, deliver more in the sphere of capabilities and the sphere of, uh, of operations. Uh, and the Americans, after uh, the changes of priorities of uh, their strategy uh, expressed uh, at the beginning of last year, as well as uh, the shift of priorities to Far East and uh, to uh, the region of Pacific, uh, they wait for 
more contribution from, from Europe. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, how do you see, how you see right now the, uh, 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 the, the, the performance of smart defense, because this is the crucial initiative uh, that we uh, delivered the, during last years, during the summits, and uh, it is uh, one of the answers for the capabilities uh, crisis. This, my second remark is about the NATO-EU relations. Uh, this working dialogue between you and uh, Lady Ashton that was uh, established uh, several years ago is a working dialogue, working dialogue without special legal regulations and uh, for everybody, I believe, uh, it, should be, it should be maintained for the benefit of the European Union and, uh, and for NATO. What are the perspectives of uh, this dialogue in your Opinion. And the third one, my third remark, is about the necessary cooperation uh, between the ACT and uh, the European Defence Agency that is crucial not only for uh, both institutions by, but uh, also for capabilities of uh, particular national, national states, uh, especially in the sphere of uh, pooling and sharing and uh, smart uh, defence. Uh, to what extent we can, we can say that it, these two initiatives are harmonized uh, right now because they should be harmonized in the progress of, uh, of both. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very interesting speech. You said NATO was a unique transatlantic forum uh, and there's no doubt about that and what I think is most encouraging is that NATO has concentrated on the new challenges of cyber security and the like and yet there's a general view that NATO is last season's thing the USA turning in on itself has to some extent downgraded NATO. My question to you is, to what extent is the United States now less interested in Europe? And my second question, pooling and sharing and the European enthusiasm for that. My question is, in NATO, or in research institutions close to NATO, has any research been done into how much taxpayers' money is being used for the upkeep of old buildings, old equipment, defense infrastructure which is now obsolete? In this crisis, I think there might be more enthusiasm for pooling and sharing but my question is can you tell me is there any research into this is it possible to do research into how much public money is wasted in this way thank you chair I would like to thank the NATO Secretary General for setting out his position can you hear me? I would like to thank the Secretary General for his comments, brief, succinct comments that were very powerful words. He spoke of the need for Europe to make a greater investment in its own security. It is true that burden sharing, the two-way street in connection with NATO. This is an age-old question that predates the fall of the Berlin Wall. Many years later, what I note is that despite it all, nothing major has changed. As 